welcome everybody. Welcome to episode number 77 of Fraternity Foodie. I am your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. Of course, we call these episodes Fraternity Foodie because there is nothing like great food to bring people together. Our guest today has been stirring up difficult conversations for over a decade, performing as a stand-up comic, speaking on stage as a diversity educator, and moving teams from abstract to action. She is a member of the National Speakers Association and is a certified speaking professional. Fewer than 10% of speakers worldwide hold this credential. When she's not traveling the country or talking on Zoom, she is spoiling her three dogs and listening to Johnny Cash cover bands helping us become the change we want to be. Please welcome all the way from Eureka, California, speaker, educator, and would-be vegan if it weren't for peanut butter, chocolate, milkshakes. Welcome to the show, Jessica Pettit. Well, thank you very much. Lucky 77, here I am. <laughs> there you are. I love it. I love it. So thank you so much for being on the show. I know this is going to be a blast for our listeners. And I have so many questions that I've wanted to ask you for so many years. And now I finally get the opportunity to do it because the curiosity was just like killing me, right? So the first question. I like to call it thanks COVID. Like we need to come up with the good things about this crazy COVID thing. So instead of passing each other in the hallways like let's actually have the conversation we've been wanting to have i totally wanted to do that sit down but you and i i mean our schedules are crazy when things are normal and now right. we get the opportunity to sit down and just have a conversation and i'm like finally i've been wondering all of these things and here we are and now we're going to let the listeners check it out too how cool is that <laughs> love it love it so all right, so first we got to start with your undergrad, right? So you decided on Hendricks College in Arkansas for your undergraduate experience. What made you choose Hendricks? So the short version is I graduated with multiple thousands of people from high school and in Texas, this is the largest high school in the United States in 1992. And uh, didn't, I did not get along with anybody basically I went to high school with. And so in Texas, you either, I had a full ride scholarship to the University of Texas Honors College and would have gone to college with everybody I went to high school with. And I got a pamphlet in the mail that was destroyed in the mail and it had the map to Hendrix. And then on the back side, it was like, and you can kayak. That is the only thing I knew about the school. And my best friend and I skipped physics on a Friday and drove six hours away. And we got there, it's a very small liberal arts college basically designed for like upper class white out of state students. Mm -hmm. And we like pulled up on campus, got a parking space and like within an hour, it seemed that everybody on campus knew my name, knew I was visiting from Texas. Like I hadn't been a name, I hadn't been a person through my entire high school experience. I had no idea how I was gonna afford it. I had no idea how I was gonna get in. And I did, and I did, and I went there. So amazing, amazing. Okay, all right. So, and you earned your master's degree in higher education from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. And now you've decided to go for your MBA at Humboldt State. So, what was the driving factor for you to go for your MBA now? Well, <laughs> and hashtag COVID. So, uh, all speaking in person at least has basically dried up because you can't travel anywhere you can't convene in a safe way so i am doing still some virtual work but uh what now seems unreal is six months ago i didn't know this was going to last this long and i was in like free fall abject grief of missing my job and so a uh, counseling technique is when you apply time when will you feel better and or when will you have figured something out and I was going through this process and I got all the way like a whole year out before I, and I don't even know that that was to feel better, but like I probably would have figured something out. So then now I have a container. So if it's a year, what could I do in this year that would make me more attractive to the clients I typically work with? And my husband is a professor at Humboldt State. So we get a partial tuition waiver. It is it's called a tuition waiver and that's a lie. It is a partial tuition waiver. It's a one-year program. It focuses on corporate social responsibility. I called about the program. I did a list, right? So uh, sheltering in place had just happened. I think the hardest part of getting my MBA was getting four transcripts at the beginning of shelter in place 
sent in to one school because they're not electronic files because they're all from the 1900s. So like somebody had to get permission to go into a vault and like pull out a sheet of paper, right? Um, then I had to take prerequisites and I'm like, well, how do I do that? But it was accounting and finance, so I took those. Um, and then classes start today, actually. So here I am, an MBA student. That's amazing. I absolutely love it. And uh, if you ever get to campus, say hi to one of our speakers, Jason Merriweather, a great guy. Wow. Oh, amazing. No, I do know him. He's, he's uh, the, the vice president of student affairs. Enrollment management. Yep. And, uh, you know, he's just an incredible, incredible guy who's telling me more about the university because he's actually uh, has spent maybe 10 years or so in my neighborhood in Tennessee because he was over at Fisk University in Nashville. So he was just recently in the area. We spent time talking about it. it sounds like an amazing place to go to school. Oh, that's fascinating. We have a bunch of friends in common because of the Social Justice Training Institute. So when he first moved here, I reached out to him, but um, he did not approve my friend request. So uh, I think his fan club must be really tight. <laughs> We're going to have to get the two of you together because he's a fantastic, fantastic guy. Um, so that's Great. really good. Yeah. So, all right. So you're at Humboldt State now and you've worked in many different capacities in higher ed. But what I was interested in for being fired a lot. <laughs> all right. We'll talk about that. All right. We'll talk about that. But I know working at NYU as the LGBT Student Services Program Advisor, for you, that was a foundational learning experience of your entire professional career. So Absolutely. I want to know what was so special about this particular experience at NYU? So technically it's my second job. So my first job was the University of Oregon, Res Life. So I just like to put that in there because it's a student affairs boot camp, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I got the job at NYU, it was the first time I had access because I went to such a small undergrad and then in graduate school, I was a grad student. I had like four full-time jobs. So I hadn't, I never really was very involved in identity-based center work, mm -hmm. let alone the intersectionality of different kinds of identities. So being the program advisor at NYU, one, I had like a giant budget. Two, I'm like competing with Puff Daddy for like locations of programs. Um, I really loved living in New York City. So I think it's also like I kind of came into adulthood, right? This was right after 9-11. So um, politically, it was also a very interesting time. John Kerry, George Bush ran for president. But my own identity, my professional identity, and the ability to use university resources to really support a marginalized community or multiple marginalized communities, it all just kind of came together. So it went from kind of, you know, basically an RA who wanted to be an RA when I grew up to kind of the intellectual studying a theory and that kind of stuff that I don't even know what that stuff means to like, no, this is relevant and important and going to help this population thrive. And then like the final kind of last piece was when I realized as a white queer person, how much privilege I have, mm -hmm. instead of doing organizing work for my subordinated places, realizing the ally and advocacy work I could do for my dominant places. All that happened at the same time at NYU. That's incredible. All right, so we have Res Life at the University of Oregon right out of grad school. Then you're at NYU. Then you start the LGBT Center at Arizona State, which interestingly enough for our audience, that was the first publicly funded LGBT resource in the entire state of Arizona. And then you go over to the University of Arizona. Um, and then in 2006, now you take this leap to start to work for yourself with your passion for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender advocacy and social justice. So I'm wondering what caused you to make this jump after working for years in different capacities of, of higher education? It's interesting is because now I would even say like four years ago, I really pivoted primarily from colleges and universities to associations and corporate, mm -hmm. but I still haven't, I haven't really left. So it looks like a big pivot or a jump. But what it basically is, is that it's a Francis K Kendall quote that I use all the time is, every system is exquisitely designed to produce the results it gets. So higher education is exquisitely designed to oppress the communities that it oppresses, silence the communities that it silences and marginalize the communities that it marginalizes 
largely so the privileged dominant students have a diverse experience. Mm -hmm. It's not about the diverse communities succeeding or thriving in college as much as it is bringing them in so someone like me can do better. So then when I left uh, higher education, corporate and association work made me realize higher education is like lightning fast and way ahead of the corporate and association world, which are also exquisitely designed systems produce the results that they get. So the, the same things are really kind of happening, switching from job to job to job. Basically every job I had in higher education, I was in charge of coming up with an assessment of how is this organization not supporting marginalized students? What are we doing well and what should we keep doing? So then I would write that report and they'd be like, ooh, truth bomb. Um, um, yes, we're going to fire you and just shred that report and start over. And then I have enough privilege, I'd go get another job doing the same thing. Well, after four or five times of doing that, one, I realized you can make a lot more money as a consultant. And oddly, everyone who's ever fired me has brought me back at a much higher paycheck to do the same damn thing that you want there. But there's also, a, it sounds like a joke, but there's also an effective strategy of scarcity that is related to a departing flight that is the expertise of every day, every week in a staff meeting. You don't get to express your expertise because you're just kind of one of them. But if you're an outsider coming in, you can truth bomb all over the place and then you leave. And that fit my personality a lot better. Uh, I have had a therapist my whole life. And I think that it's also relevant that I did not manage my supervisors well. I did not manage up well. My parents died when I was young. I am the oldest. So I never had to like be accountable to someone else. So being self-employed is really the first time I've ever been accountable to my boss. This case, my boss is myself. So I have lots of meta conversations and still put letters of reprimand in my file. But the work I'm able to do and what I'm able to access is way more successfully received than inside of like a power structure of an org chart part of the team. And it just works better. And I literally kept getting fired. So after the third time of getting fired, there's one common denominator. So then um, I was actually at a conference and at ACPA, I was facilitating whatever controversial conversation topic was at that time. And uh, Christian De La Porta, who is a speaker with Campus Speak, actually like, pulled me aside afterwards and was like, have you ever thought about being a speaker? And I was like, what are you talking about? And I had hired speakers, but it didn't dawn on me that that was a job. Similar to when I was an RA, I didn't realize the hall director wasn't just like bored, but like that was a job, a profession. So anyway, so then I had missed the um, enrollment or the application process with Campus Speak. And so then I basically was like, well, I have a year to figure out if this is what I want to do and how I do it. And University of Arizona job kind of happened at the same time in my personal life. Like I had fallen in love and he got this job here at Humboldt State and we got married and we lived apart for a year and all of this was happening at the same time. And it just, it was a very clarifying opportunity that I had no idea if I could do. So the biggest pivot or the biggest leap of faith was I quit the University of Arizona. I did not get fired. Um, I quit. I moved to California. I became financially dependent on a man who I also was married to and like put all of my eggs into this one speaking agency to see if it would work. But I also brought seven years student affairs experience working very specifically with broad stroke diversity, social justice stuff and then specific LGBT stuff. And at that time, transgender non-conforming stuff was like brand new on the discussion boards. And then within Greek life, because Campus Speak is so well known within Greek life, I had to go to this conference I'd never heard of called AFA. And I was like, oh, no, I, my type doesn't go to those things, right? So then I, my very first AFA, I walk in and I'm like, why do I know everyone here? And it's because I had done so much LGBT work within NASP and ACPA. Mm -hmm. So then all these queer people at AFA, I was like, oh, okay. So then I really observed, which I recommend if you're managing up. And no one was talking about gender nonconforming members or recruitment or alumni. And so then I just kind of like picked that 
and basically created an entire career off of it and then eventually was able to expand to much broader topics. Yeah. Now that here makes, we are. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I totally get everything that you've been through because for me, you know, working for my fraternity headquarters, I think there was a limited amount of truth bombs that I could drop. But now as a speaker, I can drop truth bombs everywhere <laughs> and it's okay. Um, and then I leave, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so I do, and I do like very little internal work with my organization, but I also didn't have like an undergrad experience. I was an alumni initiate, et cetera. But I do a lot of work with fraternities and sororities across five different councils, just mm -hmm. not mine. Right. Same thing. Yeah. Makes total sense to me. I totally get it now. So now that everything is coming together here. Now, your book, Good Enough Now, originally came out in 2017, but the second edition paperback just came out this month. And you're almost done with the ebook and the audio book. So if you want to go and pick that up, go to www.goodenoughnowbook.com. There's also a book club at www.goodenoughnowbook.com slash club. And this book essentially talks about being our authentic selves. So that way we can Im improve our companies, our relationships, our communities. And, you know, in just thinking about your book, it totally reminds me in a former life, I was a website designer and a family friend had contacted me to build a website for his live music business. And he happened to play at weddings in town. So I put together a whole website for him back in 2008, just residing on my own server. And he just never thought it was perfect to publish, whatever that meant. And no matter how many changes we made, it still wasn't perfect. And he didn't have all the text that he wanted for all the pages. And he didn't have all the right videos showcasing him yet. He didn't have all of the high-end pictures of him in action. And all of this prevented him from ever publishing a website. His business never took off the way that it should have because he's a very talented musician, despite me explaining how different my website looks today, as opposed to when I first started the business, it looks totally different. So I guess my question is, what do you say to these people who struggle with inaction or always chasing perfection? So the, what, what, stop, that's what I tell them, stop. So the, the two concepts that came up, and maybe the three concepts that came up when I was like compelled to write my book. So this like inaction perfection loop. As soon as we start talking about diversity or social justice issues, people are freeze. They have lived because they don't connect. This person would not publish their website because there might be a typo on it. Right. it what I realized is exactly why I don't know how to have a conversation with someone on Facebook that makes me nervous or like has an identity I'm not familiar with or an, a political opinion I don't agree with. So I'll pass up aggressively unfollow them or just avoid them. Right. Those are the same. There's a connection there. And so what I, my methodology is kind of a Trojan horse diversity program now and that you need to be responsible for who and how you are. That's the bottom line. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are things you're like, I want to do that. OK, but trying is terrifying. But if you try to try, then there's less judgment about whether or not it's going to be perfect. Right. So even if we look at the concept of innovation and attach it to these challenging conversations or the election or these third rail, you know, hot topics you're not supposed to talk about. What is fascinating, I think, is, is that once you realize that you can try to try to have a conversation, you all of a sudden have this ability to like screw it up because you weren't really trying, you're just trying to try. So when I look at now on a corporate level at innovation, like people release something because it's like, okay. And then you're looking for the early adopters to tell you the bugs. And then you can, you get the freedom and the space and the reward of that, that you got to upgrade. You got to update the application. We fixed something. Mm -hmm. Well, if technology only released when it was perfect, right? We still wouldn't even have a VCR. Amen. Because the very first one was like beta. What's a beta? Now people are like, what's a VCR, right? But like, the whole point is that in a team or whatever, you may or may not be rewarded for failure, but you are rewarded for trying. So can we like put that into the conversations that we're trying to have or that we desperately need to have to make connections with each other? Mm -hmm. The next thing is that we just write people off. 
Like, like, oh, well, it's just not even possible to talk to them. Well, what if it's possible that it's possible? Not to sound like a motivational speaker, but like, you can't guarantee that it is not possible. Like, my father's been dead for decades, and I have much better conversations with him now than I did when he was alive. Anything is possible. Mm -hmm. So then that kind of gives you that little one step removed to try to try, right? And then not to get into moral relativism, because I believe in only one sense of morality, but then the concept of differently right is how you, it's not about perfectionism is one way, because perfectionism is not a moral standing, but it's your way that makes you feel safe and prepared, which may not be accurate, but it certainly makes you feel safe and prepared. But you have your way too, which makes you feel safe and prepared. So where it's like, Michael, I could be full of judgment of like, what in your life taught you that this is the way to show up? And you can do that to me too, but a space of grace is actually like your life taught you that this is how you're supposed to show up. My life taught me that this is how I'm supposed to show up. Now let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's just this like one step removed kind of piece, which making the step is a step of action. And then it's not about perfection. It's about starting. So I, I put it. it all squished together into like self-awareness work. And then I use diversity topics that you're supposed to be all shy about even being able to speak about as the examples. Because if you can end up talking about abortion or gun laws, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to talk to your annoying uncle. That's true. So. It's absolutely true. Thank you so much for that advice. I think it's really spot on. And also in your book, you talk about leaving room for edits, that our story is never the full story. What did you mean by that? So similarly, like your life taught you that this is how you're supposed to show up. Mm -hmm. My life taught me that this is how I'm supposed to show up. So the limitation that's already happening is I'm not accurate. <laughs> like, I feel safe and prepared in my judgments and assumptions about what this podcast is going to be like or what your audiences are going to want to hear from my answers, right? Like I'm making judgments and assumptions so that I know how to show up. My mm -hmm. cussing filter is in and I'm like picking and choosing examples that might be relevant to who, but I don't know that I'm right, mm -hmm. but I don't care if I'm right. I care about feeling safe and prepared, right? So then if I feel safe and prepared, what I'm going to do is write a story about the person or the situation or the engagement. That's how I pick out what to wear or do I need to put Spanx on? Do I have to wear a bra? Do I have to have a cussing filter? Like, is this joke going to be appropriate, right? Like we make those choices. Leave room for edits is one to be accountable and responsible for the draft you write. Your life, my life taught me that this is the, the draft. There's habits there. There's different things, right? So then you print the draft, triple space with extra wide margins. But if you actually wrote a book and you need an editor, you like, it's like waiting for a new lover to like respond to a text. Like, have they even seen it yet? But when you give it for edits, you're curious and you're generous and you're hoping to get it destroyed. You want it to come back so much better. Why can't we employ that with one another? So I write a whole story about you. I don't want it. It's I'm right. So then I'm going to make you fit into my story that I know I am only writing to feel safe and prepared. Why can't I extend the same curiosity and generosity to the person who's the subject of the story I've drafted to actually become more accurate? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all we have to do. It's less defensive making. It's asking appropriate questions you don't know the answers to and then making the edits to your story. That's it. That's all. I would not have job security if we would just do that. But nope. So I have a mortgage. Works out great. <laughs> I love your perspective. I think it's fantastic. Now, we are in a very difficult time right now. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and I'm hearing from students who are sometimes making excuses and they're focusing too much on what we can't control. Right. So a good example right now would be recruitment in a fraternity or sorority in a virtual format that, you know, we can't possibly be successful because of the pandemic and, and we can't possibly win at this. So how do we change our perspective and instead focus on what we can control today? And maybe this is a good segue into talking about cancel culture as a whole versus consequential culture. 
So just this morning, I was, uh, I've been doing some consulting work with professors on how to like adjust their activities, their engagement, interaction on Zoom from in, in person. So I'm going to use this as an example. Okay. So we are going through how to do breakout rooms in Zoom. And the professor was like, well, I'm just so nervous because like, what if this happens or what if, this, what if, and I was like, okay, so if you were in person and you gave everybody group work, one group is going to stay in the classroom, which makes you nervous because you can't like check their own email because they're going to watch you. But everybody else is going to leave. You don't know what they're doing when they're out there. They could go take a nap. They could be making out with each other. They could go to work. They could go be doing the homework, whatever. But you told them what time to come back and you come back and you deal with it, right? And she's like, absolutely. I was like, fantastic. That is also what happens in breakouts. But because it's virtual, you're nervous about it. Yes. Right. Or so like another professor was like, what if, what if the bandwidth doesn't work? What if the internet doesn't work? And I was like, if you're in a real person class and a fire alarm goes off in class, what, what happens? He's like, Oh, well, there's just, there's, there's just no class. You just figure it out. And I'm like, you already have the skills, right? Like you, this is not about a clamp down kind of situation. Mm -hmm. We take recruitment. You've been failing at recruitment for years. I don't know why all of a sudden you're nervous about it. Right. Yes. So like, <laughs> How much recruitment have you gotten somebody? Then you were like, yeah, why did we say yes to them? Now you stuck with them until they die, graduate, or flunk out. You've been making bad choices in person all this time. You have been making bad choices about not picking someone who turned out amazing someplace else. Okay, so now you have a new system that you're nervous about picking the right person or picking the wrong person. How is that any different? The biggest difference is you don't have to wear those stupid heels anymore, right? Like, that's it. So, so just having like a realistic understanding of what it is that's happening helps you understand that when you're doing it in a different way, if you understand why you were doing it in the first place, doing it in a different way shouldn't be as terrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, like I make fun of Easy Mac all the time, like the microwave Easy Mac. When was Kraft macaroni and cheese hard to make? So now we have to make it easy. So now it's in a microwave for, I don't even own a microwave. I can't even, they have literally created a, a product I can't use because I don't have a microwave. So I'm super old school and use Kraft macaroni and cheese, which by the way, when I got my master's, I promised myself I would only eat brand label mac and cheese. That was my big commitment to myself. But if I was really being proper, I would make proper mac and cheese. I am a southerner from Texas. Like, what is wrong with me? So if I am aware of this evolutionary chart of this completely devalued what proper mac and cheese is, then I've lost touch with why I'm eating this thing in the first place. It is warm, carb, covered in cheese. That is what I'm looking for. When you get down to two minutes in a microwave and you like hit the button fast because you can't even wait two minutes anymore, you have lost why you're doing it in the first place. Recruitment, hiring, firing, one-on-one -on -one staff meetings, podcast interviews, like all of these things are just a new format of why are you doing this in the first place. Hmm. And usually what happens is that we want to control all this outside stuff instead of actually asking us the question. So like the consulting work that I've been doing with teachers, I tell them the hardest part of this is I cannot tell you what you should teach. I cannot tell you what the efficacy of what you do teach is. But if you can answer those questions, I can tell you how to do it virtually. But if you haven't reflected on why are you teaching what you are teaching and the way that you are teaching and what works, I can't help you. No bell and whistle is gonna cover up that you actually have no idea what you're doing. Right. Great point. Great point. Hopefully the fraternities and sororities are listening to that. That's a really, really important piece. Um, well, they'll listen, but they'll dismiss it because what they're going to want to do is point out who's worse than them right. and then worry about fixing them instead of paying attention to themselves, which is mm -hmm. great. Again, I got mortgage payments. Bring on your illogical behaviors and habits. <laughs> but that's all you have to stop doing is stop worrying about making them better because that's not getting us anywhere. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is they are doing that's wrong or annoying or illegal, you're probably doing too. So why don't you like pay attention over here instead of worrying about them? Right. Just some of the time would be great. Maybe something that's helpful for the students here is that in the book, you talk about what leads to long lasting connections. 
So what's your advice to students in this virtual environment to make these long lasting connections with other students? So I use the word connection on purpose instead mm -hmm. of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So but if we use recruitment as the example, mm -hmm. so if I can make fun of, and again, I did not go through this experience as an undergrad, but based on my very outside anthropological, what are you spending your money on study? In person, you are making an invitation opportunity for someone to make a commitment for the rest of their entire life over the time it takes to eat a mini cupcake. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes no sense at all. I think that NPC and NIC or IFC have a lot to learn from the other councils of how they're actually trying to find someone who is worthy of the commitment of the lifelong community. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be great, but it's not efficient. And it certainly doesn't produce massive numbers that people are making money off of. Well, right. capitalism is a different workshop. Okay. <laughs> so if we are talking about connections versus a conversation, then instead of me trying to get a number under my belt, what I would need to do is shut up and listen, already hard, to ask questions I do not know the answers to. And what's amazing is that is not hard. If you are self-reflective, you can pay attention to what it is that you know you know, mm -hmm. what it is you know you don't know. Take those two variables off the table and everything else is left. If you ask a question of someone that you legitimately have no idea what their answer is going to be, they are likely to make a better connection with you because you are legitimately interested in paying attention to what it is they are going to say. Therefore, a connection is going to be made, right? Like, I think Fired Up is probably the source material for this, but people don't join organizations or values or banners or virtual backgrounds. Right. People buy and join people. And the reason why is because they see themselves in the other person. And the only way to do that is from a vulnerable, authentic, curious, generous connection with them. Amen. It's not the t-shirts. It's not the glitter. It's the authentic connection. So love it's it. It's definitely not the glitter. Glitter <laughs> is the STI of craft supplies. <laughs> All right. I it's say, not that. <laughs> I say it's the STI of craft supplies because often you have it, but you don't know it. Someone else has to point it out to you. <laughs> Maybe it's the speedboat. Could, could we agree that it's the speedboat? <laughs> it's the <ski> lunch. <laughs> okay <laughs> so i love your talk on social justice step one knowing what you don't know so how can fraternity and sorority chapters uncover number one who they are number two know what their strengths are and then figure out what they don't know so that way that will help them to attract a more diverse group of students this fall well the the most accurate easiest answer is for an undergraduate chapter to recognize that they have the most power of their entire national organization. They are the reason it exists. They're spending way more money. One of the like behind the curtain things I like to describe is that as an alumna member of my authority, mm -hmm. I pay $25 a year for a magazine, basically. Right. Sure. Um, you are paying way more money than that. Uh, so if it's about money, then you get to do this. One of the saddest things I witnessed was at my first convention making an amendment about a something, something. And all these old people are standing up in line to talk about it, whatever. And everyone's like, oh my God, that's that person. Like our founders are dead. Like it's just the old person. It's fine. So this woman gets to the front and she's like, I don't even, I, I'm only 20. Like, I don't know if I'm allowed to have an opinion. Uh you stand in line at a microphone during the open, like that's what this is called. It's called the opinion section. And what was so sad is that if we are really doing historical work here, she's four years older than our founders were. Do you want to make a difference? Chapter level, do not worry about national stuff. Do not let them dictate what you are or are not supposed to do. Yes. Do not worry about the money. It is you and your legacy of your community and the people you want to make a connection to that created your organization to begin with in the first place. And if that is not at the center, 
it's broken. Mm -hmm. Now, do I make a lot of friends? No. Do a lot of national offices like me? No. And do they know that I'm right? Yes. Yeah. What role does your chapter play on your campus? Not nationals, but whatever that means, the spaceship of nationals. Mm -hmm. But what, what role does your chapter play on campus? And is that the role you want to play on your campus? And if it is the role you want to play on campus, how do you do that best to best serve the students that are on your campus that they can call that place home? That is what you can do and then nobody else can do that for you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I wish more students uh, understood this. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, also, let's talk about your Sticks and Stones program on LGBT 101. Why is it important for us to articulate our own stereotypes or derogatory terms for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and heterosexual people? Well, the heterosexual part is actually my favorite part of that activity, because normally when we do an LGBT ally training, we talk about everything else except for the dominant identity. Right. But heterosexual and straight people, welcome to the club. You also have a sexual orientation. And now we can talk. Uh, same thing goes when we talk about race or age. There's the dominant identity that's usually not part of the conversation. Therefore, we're burdening the work on our subordinated or marginalized identities. In that activity, we map out all of the stereotypes and slang terms and things like this. And then, shh, don't tell anyone. We then look at all of them and look at how, like, white supremacy shows up. How these people all are the same age. They would all be at the same Applebee's. Because there's some like dominant identity, white imagination narrative that fits into each of these categories that fits within the stereotype. So even though we're talking about a marginalized or subordinated group, what ends up happening is that's the one and then everything else is dominant unless we're informed otherwise. Specifically with gay and lesbian, when we get to like trans or bisexual, pansexual, omnisexual, it's not within the binary. And so then that pattern falls apart. Mm -hmm. But it's also the case, if we get all grammary, is that the tense of the lists also fall apart. So instead of describing a community, it's more about what does that community do that actually threatens the binary that exists between straight and not straight and inside not straight, gay or lesbian. So then we can actually dismantle heterosexism and this binary expectation of gender or sexual orientation that is then deeply rooted in class, ability, Christianity, political involvement, whiteness, etc. Mm -hmm. Because I can't order Taco Bell without talking about all of these things. So then we just use one as the entry point and then pull it all out. Mm -hmm. So now is a good time to talk about racism and political views, which of course is a big thing right now. Um, so how can fraternity and sorority chapters ensure that their members are heard on these difficult topics, such as racism or politics? I've personally seen chapter members, one student, a sorority member in New York comes to mind. I came off of stage and she told me this you know, story that basically she's being encouraged to not voice her opinion on these topics. It was politics at the time because her sorority felt that if she voiced her opinion, it would alienate potential new members and that would somehow impact the number of students that they could attract. So what do we do to make sure that our members feel like they're heard on these difficult topics? Take your money with you and leave. Mm. Like there, this is not a, an additional expensive assimilation process. Mm -hmm. In theory, the way that it works on paper is you have the idea of what kind of values you actually stand for. And you find a group of people who live their life based on those values, at least some of the time, and that that works. And so no matter what kind of consulting work I do with fraternities and sororities, I don't tell them what the right thing to do is, but I make them determine whatever it is they want to do. How does this align with your current values? If it doesn't, you either need to change what you're doing or you need to change your values. And if it does, then the answer is in your founding documents. The answers are in your governing documents. I'm here to like hold your hand through the process and tell you some jokes, but your founding documents are why you exist. And it's, it's not who you're going to become. It's because of the consistency of who you are as a collective. Mm -hmm. So it's about collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you are silenced 
because you think it's bad marketing. That is the bad marketing, Mm -hmm. not the being silenced in the first place. And then as far as like paying attention to people whose voices aren't being heard, which is not any new, that is a consistent. They've been telling us all day, whoever they are, the subordinated marginalized folks have been telling us their lived experience the whole time. Mm -hmm. But because we don't experience it, we don't think it's a problem from a dominant place. Problems that need to be addressed by folks from a dominant identity are literally problems they would never experience. That is why, because they are from a privileged identity, they can address a problem that they don't really deal with on a daily basis at no cost. But that's how we'll actually dismantle it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I really hate the word empowerment. And the reason why is nobody anywhere needs to be empowered. We all have innate power. What most of us need to do is to shut up and actually provide a space for people to say what they're saying and it get heard. Right. You don't need to do anything else. This is not a back an inaction kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Active listening is much harder than doing something or implementing a program. And most of the times we are implementing programs about empowerment when really what we needed to do was like put our checkbooks down and actually listen to the stories that are actually being told. Maybe if you want to get all advanced placement, notice the pattern in the stories and how you're not experiencing those things, but it's easier for you to dismiss them because you don't experience it than to take it in and listen to something. Because generally when you're privileged or you're coming from a privileged identity, you feel entitled to all experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How are you supposed to experience everything? Stop. Just stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just amazing to me. I mean, obviously our organizations, uh, you know, your sorority, my fraternity, we all started around debate. I mean, we couldn't talk about certain topics on college campuses. So we created these fraternities and sororities and we had debate uh, and that was encouraged. And so sometimes I do feel like, you know, today's society, there is some of that going on where we're not able to voice our opinions and be heard if we're not part of this, you know, dominant group that believes one way. And, and that to me is the unfortunate part about what's going on right now. So. Yeah, I agree. Oh, all right. So let's talk about something really good here. Something that I love. We love good food here at Fraternity Foodie. So if I end up in Eureka, California, I need you to tell me where should I go to get a wonderful meal? <laughs> well, first off, if you end up here, you didn't do it on accident. So I live, just so we know where we're coming from, I live six hours north of San Francisco on the water, so all the way up the 101. The Golden Gate Bridge is the base of our driveway, is how I like to describe it. Uh-huh. If you stay on the 101 north and you go, it's like 48 more miles, but it takes like two hours to drive mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. you'll get to Oregon coast. So that's where I live. So if you were here, you meant to be here. <laughs> Pre-COVID, one of the things that was amazing about here is all of like the five star chefs from Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco, et cetera, retire here and open restaurants. So we have a ton of amazing, amazing food. Um, COVID has kind of had a pretty big impact on the restaurant industry here locally, if not everywhere. So now I'm just a little questionable and I don't leave the house hardly ever, but I would say the two places that I immediately thought of when I read your question in advance, so the first place um, is called Cafe Nooner, and Guy Fieri, is that how you say his last name? Yes. The, that guy. Yeah. So uh-huh. he's actually from Ferndale, which is a small town south of here, and he has a show specifically about Cafe Nooner and some other places here in town too. But Cafe Nooner is an example of one of the things that happens here is that uh, usually due to a marriage of two uh, cultures or ethnicities of food get merged together Mm -hmm. so like cafe nooner is mediterranean and creole put together beautiful it's incredible and they do curbside takeout right now uh los bagels is a mexican and jewish relationship and they are good like new york style bagels so i'm okay don't worry about me are you sure (laughs) yes i I, this is that's like fighting words they can they can't do pizza they can do a bagel that's Los Bagels. And then my favorite place, so if we were to go out to dinner, I would take yes. you to this place. It's called okay. the Alibi. 
and they have the nice side where all the tourists go and it's new and pretty and then they have the dive side where like the lights are low and you don't want to look at the carpet <laughs> but they have the best burgers and french fries which is I my favorite it. I love it. So I'm going to take you out to Alibi when I get to your neck of the woods. And I will get to your neck of the woods. So I'm definitely Can't looking wait. forward to that. That sounds awesome. All right. So where should our audience go to connect with you or follow you online if they have more questions for you or maybe they want to bring you to their campus? So you can always go to JessPettit.com. There's four T's in my last name. Nobody can spell my name. So you can go to GoodEnoughNow.com as well. Um, but I'm happy to do it. I've been doing tons of virtual programming. So there's all kinds of options available. And I really, really, um, I love what I do. And I wish I didn't have to do it. But you won't do it. So I'll still show up. That's how I look at it. I love it. Bring Jess to your campus. She's absolutely amazing. I love spending time with you because we just don't get enough time to do it on the road. We're always running around. And so I appreciate this time. Can't wait to uh, have a burger with you at Alibi. And uh, we'll see you sometime soon on the road, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, that'd be so great. Remember the road. I know, I know. I long for it too. It's going to come one day, I promise you. It's coming. <laughs> this, this is probably like the weirdest craving I've had because it's so food related. Uh -huh. But Terminal C, O'Hare Airport. And I, I just hope they're still open eventually because nothing's open now. But the make your own salad place dangerously yes. close to the big dinosaur. Yeah. So the pasta salad, you get to pick the toppings with extra French dressing. Like that, I would kill for that right now. Because are, it would are be we even going to have that? Are buffets going to be a thing in the future? <laughs> it's travel. Are airports going to be a thing? So many questions. So many questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you like this video, please like it and share it. Send it to somebody else that you know that might be interested in some of Jess's programs because she's fantastic, I have to tell you. So thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you on another episode of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.